Imagine, if you will, a car, a red Kia Forte to be exact, heading west early tomorrow morning. And in the first rays of the rising sun, we see the bounties, the bounteous farms of western Indiana, which soon transitions into the fertile prairie of Illinois. By late morning, we are driving through the rolling, corn-laden hills of Iowa until we cross the wide Missouri and find ourselves amidst the amber waves of grain on the Great Plains. But that's only the start. In the days ahead, we'll see the winter wheat being harvested in eastern Colorado. The deer and moose and elk and longhorn sheep of the purple Mount Rocky Mountain region feasting on alpine flowers and will drive past cattle and sheep grazing in Wyoming. Fields of potatoes growing in the fertile soil of Idaho. The apple orchards of Washington State. You want to come with us? As we pass through this land, the words to today's psalms no doubt will ring out in my mind and heart because, yes, this earth, this land is filled with God's bounty. You know, sometimes I am overwhelmed by God's generosity, by God's provision, by God's open hands, as the psalmist says, open hands desiring to satisfy every need. All God's creatures looking to God to give them their food. But the 900 million people in this world who go to bed hungry every night might sigh or might turn away in frustration at, at the psalmist's assertion of, of a bountiful God that supplies food and drink to all, satisfying their need. Yeah, right, they might say. So how might today's psalmist respond to today's reality? when so many people are hungry and malnourished, more than the combined populations of the United States and Canada and the European Union go to bed hungry at night, what might these psalms have to offer for us in this day and in this age? Well, before we try to respond to this question, let's talk a little bit about the context in which these psalms were written. Most scholars say that they were written several thousand years ago when the area that we now know as the Middle East was sparsely populated and probably had no more than 200,000 people living in the region. Cities weren't cities as, as we know them, but towns of a few hundred, a few thousand people. Most folks farmed. Far fewer were able to raise sheep and goats. And most people would never travel more than 10 miles from where they were born throughout their lifetime. The extended family was the critical key to helping folks to quite literally stay alive. And these ancient Jewish folks had a practice that they had observed for generations and passed down. You see, those who farmed knew to never ever harvest the last square, every last square foot of their crop. They always left the edges of the field unharvested so that the poor, the familyless, the widow, the immigrant, the orphan knew that they could always find food to harvest from the field's edges, knew that they would never be hungry. Now this practice called gleaning was the, a central virtue and value going back to the dawn of the Jewish people. It made it possible for those on the margins, those on the edges, to live. The beautiful story of Ruth lifts up this practice. 
almost a spiritual practice of doing God's will. Today, however, in our very, in our time and context, this wonderful practice of the family and faith communities making sure that others don't go hungry is quite a bit more challenging, isn't it? The reason is that in the days when the Psalms were written, the entire Jewish population of this vast territory was smaller than the population of Indianapolis. And so it was, in those days, very, very possible for families and faith communities to stay on top of the needs of the poor among them, to have simple systems and practices that ensured that, that no one would go hungry. Today, however, we know that that simply is no longer the case. We live in a country where there are more than 325 million people, and an estimated 20% of our population moves every year. We are a transient population. An increasingly smaller percentage of the population have extended family that lives nearby. And dramatically fewer are part of any church or faith community. That's the time we live in, which means that more and more people do not have the family or the community connections and the support they need to help them out in trying times which means that churches and synagogues and mosques are no longer equipped to take care of the growing needs of their communities. And as one blogger said, they really haven't been able to do so since the Industrial Revolution transformed us from an agrarian to an urban nation. The Reverend David Beckman, who was a Lutheran pastor and a trained economist and president of Bread for the World, says that churches and food banks alone simply cannot feed the millions of hungry American families. As a matter of fact, all the food that the churches and charities provide to hungry people is only about 6% of what is provided by our government supported government supported nutritional programs nutrition programs Beckman says that if every church in our countries in our country that's about actually every faith community it's about 335,000 faith communities if every one of these would commit to feeding this country's homeless it would mean that each congregation, including ours, would need to give more than $60,000 a year over the next 10 years to offset next year's proposed budget that deals with our nutrition program. Now, churches, including ours, do excellent work in our communities to help meet the needs of the hungry and vulnerable. However, quite frankly, we could not take on this burden alone. So how do we, how do we with any sort of integrity sing about God's bounty in a world, in a nation that is so unlike the psalmist world, where so many do go hungry? How can we with any integrity, sing God's bounty when we can't meet these needs. Well, as we sing of God's bounty, we can also sing with the psalmist in 145 who says, the Lord is just in all his ways. And then, when we sing of God's justice, we can come, become partners with God to make this world more just and more equitable. We can also sing with the psalmist, The Lord is faithful. The Lord upholds the faltering feet. The Lord supplies food and drink where all can eat until they are satisfied. And then, we as people of faith can do God's work of justice and generosity. These psalms lend us 
the ability to not just sing of God's bounty, but to do God's justice. Because you see, God lavishes food on this earth like an all-you-can-eat buffet. God wants all God's people to be fed, wants no one to live with the misery of a chronically empty stomach, and has made it possible for there to be enough food for all God's creatures. The psalmist says that, and the good news is that that's true today. The good news is that there is enough food on this good earth that no one should ever have to go hungry. I'm starting to sound like a psalmist. Let me say that again. There is enough food on this good earth so no one should ever, ever go hungry. Praise God. The world produces 17% more food than it did 30 years ago. Praise God. But still, hundreds of millions of people, the majority children, go to bed hungry every night. The world already produces enough food to feed more than its population, but still, one-fifth of the world's people are chronically hungry and malnourished. Why? Why this disconnect between what the psalm says, between our faith, between the reality? Why? Well, it's because God's justice is not being carried out. According to the World Hunger Organization and according to the Psalms, hunger is not caused by lack of food. It is caused by issues of injustice, issues of inequity, poverty, and conflict domestic and foreign policy, political instability and job instability, all these things leave people hungry. In other words, from the perspective of the psalmist, our partnership has been broken. Our partnership with God has gone awry. The food chain in this world has so many kinks and bottlenecks in it that the bounty that God lavishes on the earth does not reach everyone who needs it, particularly those who are most vulnerable. God's hopes and desires, God's generosity and God's justice, God's will, all thwarted. So what is our role as Christians? It's not enough simply to wallow in guilt, and guilt never really does anything to change things, does it? How do we acknowledge the bounty of this earth and out of gratitude and in partnership with God, take care of all God's people and God's good earth. Well, we can do it by addressing the symptoms, and which we do through the Mac and Food Drives and through our breakfast ministry and through our work with the Interfaith Winter Shelter at Wheeler. It's important to address the symptoms. I mean, when you have a terrible cold, you can't kill the virus, but you can take NyQuil so you can at least function the next day. We can take care of the symptoms, and, but we can also, as people, as Christians who want our nation to reflect those values formed by our faith, we can insist that the root causes be addressed. We can do this by responding to our moral call to practice our citizenship and to engage with our government. We can remember that we are serving God, that we are in a healthy partnership with God when we raise issues of hunger and poverty with our elected officials, when we stand up for God's justice, when we speak up both with and on behalf of all God's children. That's one of, part of what it means to be a Christian today in this age and in this place and in this nation. The reason that I support 
bread for the world. It is, is that it is unapologetically Christian and it is unapologetically nonpartisan and its mission is to unapologetically proclaim God's grace by using its collective Christian voice to urge our nation's decision makers to end hunger both at home and abroad. And this offers me, as a Christian, a way to do something, a way to make a difference, a way to make my voice heard, a way to engage in doing God's will. Speaking of voices being heard, 125 years ago, Catherine Lee Bates, who was an English professor from Massachusetts teaching at Wellesley College, took her first trip west. Her destination was Colorado Springs where she was to teach summer school. Her route took her on a similar route that Bruce and I will begin tomorrow. And as she traveled, her breath was taken away over and over again as she took in the beauty and bounty of the land. At the end of her summer, she and some of her colleagues rode to the top of Pikes Peak on one of those old prairie wagons that says Pikes Peak, Peak or Bust. You've seen pictures. And up at the Pikes Peak, she was blown away by the view. Later on, she wrote this. It was then and there as I was looking out over the sea-like expanse of fertile country spreading away so far under those ample skies that the opening lines of a hymn floated into my mind. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. On this day, it is appropriate that we sing this hymn at the end of our service. And when we do it, let us sing it as a psalm, in the same way that the ancient Jews sang Psalm 145 and Psalm 104. Let us sing it with joy and humility and awe in the presence of a God whose desire and will is that all might be fed and satisfied. And when we sing, and I'll, I'll remind us a little bit later on, but when we sing it, let's notice that the first half of each verse proclaims the beauty and the bounty of the land, but the second half of each verse offers a humble prayer to God. Yes, a prayer that asks for God's forgiveness that we might serve. Ask for God's grace. Ask for God to refine us and purify us. Ask God to heal our brokenness and mend our every flaw. As Christians, let's pray that prayer. And then as Christians, Let's act on that prayer. God, shed your grace. God, mend our flaws. God, refine us. Saint Mother Teresa, Teresa, who dedicated her life to feeding the hungry and to prayer, said this. I used to pray that God would feed the hungry but now I pray that God will guide me to do what I am supposed to do to feed the hungry, what I can do to feed the hungry. I used to pray for answers, but now I pray for strength. I used to believe that prayer changes things, but now I know that prayer changes us, and we change things. And so be it. Amen.